Okay, hello once again guys. You're watching High Voltage Mayhem and today I wanted to bring you a quick video on this old Zenith radio. I would like to discuss how to use one of these old things if you happen to pick one up and uh, what to do when you find one. So the first thing we want to do is take a look at the radio itself and we'll notice that it's in very good condition. Nothing's missing on the sides. The uh, paint is still in relatively good shape. All of our knobs are there and the dial indicator is here. So upon first inspection of this radio, you'll notice that the dial indicator is on a hinge. We can actually lower it down just like this and it'll click into place so we can carry this radio around. Very portable. Now, I would like to pull down this little tab and raise this indicator up and let's go over some of the controls on here. So naturally we would assume that when we turn this potentiometer to the right that we would hear a click indicating that the power switch has been tripped and the radio would be energized. However, this is not the case. This is potentiometer is strictly volume only. Now, if we look at the other potentiometer, we'll notice that it's actually not. It actually just has a string over there. It's a variable capacitor, and it moves the dial indicator. Now, as far as powering this radio, as soon as you plug it in, the radio will actually come on. There is no on-off switch. Very interesting. So, let's take a closer look at this thing and see what necessary things we might do to restore this radio. Okay, so upon first inspection of these old radios, we'll notice that some of the paint is missing on the lettering. Well, that's actually a very, very simple fix, and it can be done relatively easily with no hassle or cleanup necessary. So, the first thing we'll see is that these letters are carved into the plastic material itself, so that won't be any problem repainting that. And I have a quick tip I would like to share with you in order of how to fix that. So the first thing you would want to do in order to fix the lettering, which is not a major problem at the moment, but you can simply take some white out. And you can brush the white out across the lettering and it'll fill these voids here. And as soon as it dries, just take your fingernail and brush it off and it'll look good as new. Very interesting tip. So, if we look at the radio, you'll notice that the case has a handle on it, spring-loaded, so you can carry it around and then it automatically retracts back into place with springs located in here. So very simple to carry this thing around. Now let's take a look at the back and see what we can do about looking at the tubes. Alright, here we are at the back of the radio and I want to pull off the cover and show you what's inside. So just pull that cover, it comes right off, got some latches on here, and there you can see the inside. So, I will zoom you in on here in just a moment and I will show you what we got going on. So the first thing we notice is look at this huge battery. So that is a big old alkaline battery. So that's definitely a dry cell. And we got four pin connector right here. As you can see the four pin connector on here and that's Bakelite too. So pretty brittle material they used back in the day. Uh, another problem you'll catch right off the bat is our power cord needs replacing so we'll definitely have to fix that. Um, if we look around I'm going to show you in more detail tube layout and what to look for about these tubes, so I'll get into this later. But for now, I just want to focus your attention on some of the physical components. So as you'll notice, we have variable capacitor here for tuning. We have some other capacitors. I bet that's an array of capacitors on the inside. Variable transformers, and of course that's our audio output transformer. Just various components like this. And so this is basically what it looks like. So in just a moment, I will give you a, a more in-depth description of what goes on here and what all these tubes are and how you can identify them by looks and and or location. So here's a closer look at the battery I pulled out of this unit. As you'll notice we have Zenith radio battery written on the side. Um, there's actually two batteries in here and it's tapped for multiple voltages because if you look on the side it says 9 volts on the A pin and 90 volts that's direct current 90 volts on the B pin so that means that we have 9 volts supplying our filament for all the tubes and then we have 90 volts for the kind of like the plate current so we have our main power is 90 volts for the vacuum tubes and then of course our heating element runs on 9 volts so this is a very interesting battery as you can see there's substantial dust on here since it's been sitting in this radio for so long and we have some uh, important notices on here that's backwards so let's take a look at that and see what it says it says it's designed to give the best service when operated with a genuine Zenith battery pack. So they're just basically wanting you to buy their battery. So if you'll notice, the alkaline has leaked out a little bit on this side and has 
damage the labeling. Well, that's a shame because this printed so nicely on here. However, we can turn it around on the other side and everything looks quite nice. So let's take a look here. We have Zenith radio battery. Just basic Zenith stuff. Is there anything interesting on this side? Ah, let's see. We got power, famous long life. So they, they must have been pretty proud of these batteries if they're advertising things like long life. For it to even be intact nowadays is really something. So that's just the battery itself that powered this radio. And this thing really is heavy. If I try and pick this up, mm, it's about as heavy as a big can of soup. I mean the, the big cans of soup. This thing's heavy. So I can imagine just having this thing in there and hauling the radio around. So we can definitely find a replacement for it. Anything that's 90 volts and has a 9 volt for the filament. And we can get that radio portable. So very interesting battery we found in there. Okay, so before I dive into restoration of this radio and what needs to be done to fix it, or how to get one working whenever you pick one of these things up, I'd like to show you what I found on the inside first. So I found some newspaper clippings here that were stuffed, kind of wedged between the battery and the case to kind of keep the battery stay put, situated anyways. So I would like to show you the date that I found on these papers. So if the camera will focus on here, if that is, you'll see December 10th, 1951. So very interesting we found these old papers inside this radio. Um, let me show you some of the what goes on in these papers. So as you see, we got some ad for some Camel cigarettes. We even have a joke, except we can't laugh at it because he's cut off. But oh well. So we've got this paper here. We also have another one from 1951. And what's really interesting is we have a repair slip from Fred Whitaker's radio shop. And uh, we can see Lieutenant R.W. Spence... And the address is to base, so this must have been military, because he's lieutenant. We have, let me see here, we've got the Zenith radio, as you can see it says here, and a 3V4 tube, so that was replaced, and then service. So altogether, the expense was $3.06. Wow, I wish we had those prices today. So very interesting, a service repair. And, um, wow, that's just very interesting. So now that we've seen kind of what was in that radio, a little bit of history, let's see what we can do about opening up the chassis and get some restoration done. Alright, so I've brought this radio into the electronics lab. And what I plan to do is pass a voltage through this radio at a very low current so that if anything is to short out, we won't get any smoke, but rather we'll get a reading on the gauge. So what I want to do is go ahead and crank the voltage up to about you know, 60 volts which is the voltage at which the tube amplifier should begin to operate. So we're going to give this radio just a little bit to warm up. And here in a second, I'm going to turn the voltage up to 110 volts AC at very low current. So we can check for shorts and to see if the radio works at all. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the volume knob all the way up so we can hear the amplifier start to work. And I'm going to go ahead and turn the voltage up and let you hear what the radio sounds like. All right, you can kind of begin to hear some static coming out of there. Yep, I hear some static. Let's move the uh, let's move the knob here and see if we can get any channels. Well, there for a second, I thought I heard a voice. Yeah, I'm not hearing anything coming out of here other than static. I start to hear some voices every now and then. However, I don't hear anything. It's not loud enough. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off the power supply so we don't cause any damage to the rest of the circuit if something's shorted. We, did, we didn't draw any current, so that's always a good start. So since the radio is not loud enough, that leads me to believe that there is an amplifier tube in there that's bad. So we're, we could be talking a preamp tube or the main amplifier. So what I want to do is since we obviously can't hear anything at 60 volts and we couldn't hear anything at 120 hardly, it should have well been working into the 65, 70 volts range. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out a Military 177B tube tester and I'm going to go through testing the tubes on the inside of this radio to see if we can't spot a bad tube. So here we are looking at the back of the chassis and I want to start off by talking a little bit about tube layout because sometimes we can get an idea of what the engineers were thinking by looking at the physical layout of the tubes on the radio. So if we start off, we'll look here in the corner, you'll notice right here there is a little bitty tube hiding over there in the corner. Well that is a 1S5 tube and usually that's an amplifier tube, in this case it is, and sometimes that tube can be used as a preamp. So a lot of times on these old radios, the people will hide the preamp tube over here in the corner or they'll hide it somewhere on the side of the case where it's uh, separated from the rest of the amplifier tubes and usually that can tell us that that's a preamplifier tube because they kind of hide it off to the side. I've noticed that a lot in these old radios. We also have a 1U4 and we have another amplifier tube here. I've tested both of these this one is okay, but the 1U4 is weak, so we're definitely going to have to check that one out. And by the way, this is a pre-amplifier tube here, or an amplifier tube rather, and it is bad. So we've tested this one and we confirmed that that is bad. So that's definitely going to have an effect on why this thing's not loud enough. So if we look over here, well, you'll notice that there are some power transformers. And usually, next to a capacitor bank, there'll be a rectifier tube. Because right over here in this area, generally, there'll be either you know a frequency changer tube something like that or a, a rectifier power supply tube so in this case what we have here is a 1R5 and then that is located directly next to this capacitor bank here and by the power transformers so of course the rest of the case we have our potato slicer which is a, a variable capacitor that helps with tuning of the radio so based on the physical layout of these tubes that can help us determine what's wrong so when I was going through and looking for the bad tube as to why this radio wasn't loud enough, I first saw this little guy here in the corner, and I said, ah, that's got to be the preamp, or that's got to be something that's wrong, because, you know, it's just isolated, and usually that's what's wrong when there's low volume. And if that's not the case, you can either check one of these amplifiers and test each one of those, and if one of those gives you trouble, then there you go, because this is the only circuit that deals with the audio, because it goes from these tubes to this audio output transformer and then to the speaker. So if it's not within this circuit, then you've got problems somewhere else. So surely it would be in this area of the radio. So that's just a easy way to navigate your way around here. If there's a whole lot of tubes, like say you've got a transmitter or something, something really big, that's an easy way to narrow it down if something's not loud enough. So here I've pulled out the 177B tube tester. This was a signal core tube tester built for the Army in the early 1940s. So this is a good machine to test these old tubes because we are working with equipment from the same time frame as our radio. So very simple, if I hit this amplifier button, you'll notice the needle lands in the red. That indicates we have a bad tube. So just to further clarify, this is a good or bad reading meter. So basically if we hit the amplifier and it's in the red, we got a bad tube. Unless the manual gives us a specific reading we should get for that tube. So obviously we see that there is issues with this tube so let me give you a zoomed in look at the meter and we'll see further in depth what's wrong with this tube. So here's a zoom in of our tube tester. We got everything turned on and it's ready to go. So I'm first going to hit line test and what that does is makes our needle go to the line. So I'm going to adjust it just a little bit to where that needle is on the line test. So that means that this meter is now calibrated and ready to go. So now I'm going to hit the amplifier test and see if this tube's any good. Nope, we got a bad tube. So you'll notice that needle came up to about here and then stopped. That's because our tube is bad. So we should be getting a reading way into the green all the way on the right and we're getting a very bad reading on this tube so that means that we'll need to replace this preamp and hopefully that will solve our volume problems so after all of that talking it really just comes down to these few items in the radio so we've noticed that the amplifier tube 1S5 has been tested and it does register bad so that's obviously a problem that we're going to have to fix next of all the amplifier 1U4 the tube over there by the audio output transformer tested weak. Now that's questionable when a tube test is weak because usually it'll still work however the signal won't be very strong. We'll have low amplitude or in this case low volume. Now we checked uh, the frequency changer which is a 1R5. Now that, that tube was interesting because the first test was okay but it had two tests for that tube and the second one was rather questionable. The, the, needer, the needle was jumping all around just like that so 
Um, that's questionable whether that tube is good or not. So we're going to test the radio without changing this one out first to see if that has to be the problem. And then, of course, if there's anything else, we have to replace capacitors and other components that are faulty. And I'll get into that later, but I know that this radio's capacitors are okay for this for as far as our testing purposes are concerned. However, in the long run, I do suggest you change them out because they will give you problems down the road. Well, now that we have assessed the problems with this radio, what we need to do is find tubes and get parts. So this does kind of bring the episode one to a close, or part one rather, of this video, because it is time to go on eBay. So what I need to do is I need to order the parts that we need for this radio. So I'll have to make a second part to this video in order to show you the full restoration of the radio. So what I'm going to do is go and grab some tubes and everything else, and as soon as they get in, I will make the second part of this video for you, and hopefully you can see this radio in operation. So thank you for watching. This is High Voltage Mayhem, and if you'd like to, subscribe for more content, and I will try my best to keep the videos coming. So thank you again for watching. This is High Voltage Mayhem, and I'll see you next time.